to the inner verse. Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse Podcast. It's me, Chance, and I am, as usual, incredibly excited for the conversation we are about to premiere into your ears. So we all know that the mainstream medical mafia system is incredibly broken and inverted. And what's super hilarious about it is that they call what we are interested in here and in our spheres of communication, the alternative. When in fact, when you break that word down, you're saying alter native which is exactly what the allopathic method is all about. Taking the native, altering it, (laughs) inverting it is a better word, and handing it back and calling poison medicine. Now, with that, there are positive effects, but there's a slew of what are called side effects. And in my opinion, side effects are just effects. And we are going to be getting into the beautiful, beautiful flow of conversing today about how herbs, how nature already gave us exactly what we need, shows us how to know what it is that we need through the doctrine of signatures, through the shape, the color, the vibration, the feeling, the seasonality of different plants and herbs. We can know so much in a very intuitive way. In fact, it almost seems magical, the amount of wisdom that our guest today, Kyle Denton of Typica New Herbs, is able to distill just from the eyes, the ears, the smell, the touch of these beautiful gifts that are here on the the realm with us in the plant kingdom. I met Kyle at the Bertaria National Festival. And after that really fun event where we hung out practically the whole weekend, Kyle came and visited me in my hometown. We went to my favorite park, had a nice little herb walk, and he gave me a private lesson on many of the things that grow native around my area, what they're good for. And when I say what they're good for, what I truly respect about Kyle's perspective is that he is all about exalting the the virtues of the plant rather than considering them as mechanistic uses, that these are beings with virtues. And these beings have life force energy just like we do, and they're communicating with us. And it's not just a one-way street of some kind of product off the shelf that has really no life to it that's been washed clean of anything wiggly or, or, or dirty. You know, anyway, I'm kind of going on and on. I'm just so excited about this conversation. There's a lot in it. We may get into like astro herbology, if you will, the sky clock of the plant kingdom and, you know, the alchemy of what Kyle does at Typica New Herbs. He's provided me with some tinctures I'd love to talk about. And Yeah, let's just get into it. Kyle, man, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you. I could keep introducing you all day, but let's get into it. Welcome to the podcast, brother. Thanks so much, Chance, man. It's an honor to be a guest on this podcast. I love your work. I love what you do. Um, I really enjoy hanging out with you too. And and one of the reasons why is just because we can just bounce ideas off each other. And so that's why I'm excited for this conversation right now. Yeah, man. So excited for this. So Kyle, you're up in Milwaukee with Typica New Herbs. You have an actual shop. I hear you have even got employees. So you've grown your dream into something very, very nourishing and sustaining for your family. You're moving into a role as a teacher. You know, your family's beautiful, by the way. Congratulations. (laughs) And I'd love to just, you know, if you want to tell us about any aspect of your story of from, from there to here whatever parts of it sound feel feel good to talk about to warm us up into this conversation and introduce us to who you are i, I would love you to take it away bro thanks man um so yeah you're right i got a store here in milwaukee 
It's a lot more than that, though. It's um, it's one of the only places in uh, the country that makes it's a herb shop that makes all the medicine that we stock. So we have a kitchen in the back, apothecary um, laboratory space where we uh, create all of our medicine, and we do that by foraging it. So we go out into the wild and we forage and. We work with local farmers to get lots of uh, the plants that we have from our local region. And I'm always trying to get the highest quality plant because I know that that will deliver the best relationship with the people that come to see us. Um, but my story as an herbalist, uh, I, I, like, I guess I like to find the role of community herbalist because I do a lot of things. I do, um, I do the plant medicine making, I do the selling <laughs> market stuff, I do the um, I, I do a lot of uh, clinical work as well, um, and I teach. That's one of my favorite things to do is my role as a teacher. So I have a an herbal school that we have, um, you know, an online program. We have an in person program, but I just opened up the online program, and that's kind of a a new calling for me. I've always been more um, in my element with working in front of a plant in the wild with a group of people and being kind of like bridge between. Um, that learning space. And so that's always been a, a really, really exciting part for, for my, for my work. Um, I started, I've been doing herb craft, I don't know, since 2011 to around 2012. Um, and I started in the Ayurvedic tradition and, uh, in that tradition, um, I was really called to the herb craft of that, but a lot of the plants were just like herbs in jars you know, powders and jars. I didn't really have a good relationship with them. And as a wild food forager at the time, I was like really interested in getting deeper into the connection with, uh, uh, I guess the Ayurvedic aspects or the energetic patterns that I, that I knew from a foundational aspect of the doshas and stuff like that in Ayurveda to apply that, overlap that to what I see in my area and my biosphere. And, um, and then from there, I just kind of branched out and I, I, um, I kind of, uh, incorporate a lot of Western herbalism, um, which is a really good amalgamation of all kinds of things. Uh, it's, you know, Greek, Greek herbalism with, or Greek medicine with the four humors or, um, or Appalachian folk medicine or native American medicine, all of these, all of these, um, things have a foundational aspect, which all. I think is the most important thing to uh, learn when you're learning about plant communication or learning about plants is, is having that foundation, a good thing where you can just take those energetic qualities and overlap them to what you're, what you're looking at. And, um, so, yeah, that's a little My, question about that. Yeah. The, you say that these systems have foundational aspects. Would you say that that is like a language akin to learning the biofield anatomy or something? And that if you have different languages, you can sort of adapt and MMA that together. Yep. So like, let's say in Ayurveda, we have, it's, it's based on these, uh, the language in Sanskrit. So that was one of the difficulty. That was one of the difficulties for me was like, I had to first translate something to a language that I didn't understand. Um, and then try to extrapolate the, the translation of that in, in my language that I do understand. And so when we have like the doshas of Ayurveda, which are like the, I guess the energetic qualities, I guess you could say, um, there are, they have Sanskrit names, uh, Vata, Pitta, Kapha, but they can be translated roughly speaking to like, uh, air and ether or wind and ether, um, or fire or earth or water. And you can find overlapping in all of these different foundational things, that pattern which is trying to describe the fundamental elements however we call them no matter regardless of the the names or the language that we give them we call them here in, in english we'll call them earth air fire water and the and the ether or the quintessence right so um find figuring out what those patterns are from a foundational aspect and then overlapping them and then using different systems for different jobs i guess you could say in the same way that you would have a couple of different wrench sets for a couple of different, you know, machines that you might work on or something. That is so cool. That sounds exactly like the way I would want to approach it. <laughs> that, you know, the more frame intellectual frameworks or scaffoldings you have to climb on, 
it's like you, you don't get stuck in a specialization. You're more of a generalist, which means you can generate even new insights that wouldn't be available to somebody in just one of those specializations. So is there more? I'm kind of curious about some of these other systems that you have uh, in your toolkit. Are there some things that we could say about the foundational aspects of some of the languages that you work with in the in between you and the plants that might be useful or interesting for people to take on as a, a knowledge base? That's exactly what I teach because when I started studying herbalism a, a while back, I was spinning my wheels because I was learning about, you know, this plant for that. Let's say like, um, like uh, peppermint for upset stomach. And so I'd have to commit to memory like a plant and then a upset stomach. But instead, um, when, I, when I learned about the foundational patterns and I, I was able to recognize, I don't need to know what the name of the plant is. I don't need to know anything about the plant. I can discern from these, these aspects that it's offering through um, several ways, through you know, our material senses and other spiritual senses, what that plant will do and apply it over the condition that I see. So I don't even need to know like uh, a fancy word for upset stomach, like, uh, or, you know, like GERD, all, all those words, they don't need to mean anything to me either. They can just be, um, we can just ask, let's just say um, the question, um, somebody says, oh, I have GERD. And I say, okay, what does that mean to you? What is it like, in which way? Um, I'm, I'm trying to, Pin, uh, pin down is it is it a condition that might be um, fiery and hot or is it a condition where there's like stagnation and cold is it is there like too much tension involved does it feel like tightening and constricting does it feel like it's loose like things are just moving out um, does it feel like it's dry <clears throat> and itchy or is it like really damp and there's a lot of moisture and I'm trying to find those patterns and I can see when I can take that from the individual and not their, not their, um, I have GERD or whatever, and then uh, uh, reconfigure it in an individual case and then, and then take what I know about the plants and say, okay, this one is heating, this one is drying, this one is warm, warming, this one is cooling, this one has dampening qualities, this one has drying qualities. Um, and, and so when, when that pattern recognition clicked with me, then my, ex, my um, the way that I understood how to work with people, how to work with plants, and how to make the right connection to the right plant for the right person was really accelerated because I was able to get out of the paradigm of memory and put it back into the paradigm of like my relationship with how I experience the plant and my, and my relationship with how I'm understanding the presentation of the person in front of me or myself. Um, I, I start on myself. So what, what I'm experiencing first and then moving into a practitioner role, but that's, that's the idea. This is so cool because, uh, I mean, and we've talked about this before and I, I was kind of getting it, but after some <laughs> insights that I had over the music and sky festival event, you know, for insights, just continue and continue. They pile on, but yeah. I really got it. I really started to get the whole map is not the terrain thing <laughs> and how language is a map and how in the inverted world, inverted society, or maybe just kind of like the laziness of it all and wanting shortcuts and authority to tell you that we've replaced feeling or we've attempted to put the language before the feeling. And so when it comes to the many, many, many plants in the wide universe that we inhabit that if you were to try to take all that committed to memory of like this is its name and by the name of it I'm going to remember that that name associates with this condition and it's used for that and that's like separating you through this linguistic medium from the actual felt lived reality experience of what the plant has going on qualitatively right so what you're doing is you're putting the feeling, the quality before the language. The language is like a useful tool that may or may not even be necessary as a secondary component, but the feeling and the, the quality, which is apparent to us, as long as we're not filtering our, what we feel like we can or can't know through this lens of language and memorization. You know, if you just sort of take those glasses off of <laughs> that it needs to, that I need to categorize it, 
and just go like, how does it feel? What's the pattern? You're doing the syncretism of, you know, you've got the keys of syncretism for the plant world, the way that maybe I'm working on and seeking to build the keys to the language world. Because even language has this primary root feeling component that's before what we now call language in terms of like the, the, ooh, ah, you know, like everybody calls their mom, ma, doesn't matter where you're from. So there's like some primary feeling that you can get to that's before the, and then language derives from, and that applies to everything and especially the plant kingdom. So like the map is not the terrain, the language is not the quality. And it sounds like that's sort of the, what's really clicked for you and yep. taking you to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. I see. I think, I think yes. And both for the, for that as well, because I also think that, you know, there are some things that just have to be within that pattern in order for them to be properly expressed. And that's the, that's the, the real nuts and bolts of like trying to get down to like understanding, you know, it, can I call this person anybody else than Ma? You know, would they be able to respond? They know there's like an archetypical resonance that's created. And I think it inhabits um, the structure also that is created as well. Um, but yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what I like doing because, um, you know, you see something in there and we say, oh, that's that here, this here is peppermint. Um, in Latin, it's pipe, preta, mintha, blah, blah, blah. And we have all these different names for it. Um, but really the peppermint's uh, sitting there like, uh, I'm not my name, dude. <laughs> I'm just peppermint. I'm just this plant. And I do these things. Like I, I create all of this medicine in all these ways and I'm doing this stuff. But uh, that's, you know, maybe that not what I would call myself either. So yeah, exactly. Getting away from, I mean, <laughs> But also, you know, knowing that because we're human beings and we're hardwired to categorize things, um, there's no, this is where the and and but comes in. There's nothing wrong in my mind about um, learning those things and apply, and then having that scaffolding for building up those categorized patterns. Um, it's just getting down to the bottom of it where that pattern is at its most basic. Um, and that's, that's where, to me, the doctrine of signatures comes in. That's where the, the, the real rubber meets the road between the creator and the creation and those, those archetypical patterns. Yeah, dude, you're exactly right. It's the, the language aspect, the categorization aspect is highly useful. Like we didn't just develop the ability to do that or we weren't gifted this pattern recognition mind that is so powerful and awesome for no reason or because like that's not a, and it's not a, uh, bad thing it's not there to hurt us or cause us uh, problems but like it's just putting things in order right you know you're putting the real before <laughs> the category rather yeah. than deciding what is or isn't real based on the category which sometimes you know we get categorization wrong and then it, whenever you're doing it backwards you're almost like appealing to authority over yes. experience and then you put it in the right order feeling perception doctrine of signatures you're putting you know reality primary to categorization you're making truth your authority rather than authority your truth in a way that's it. that's the reason why i teach the things that i teach and the reason why i learn the things that i learn because i got all these authors i got all these books i'm learning all these things but i always have to remember what did that person say about this plant or this that condition and instead the way that I really like to teach is I want to give people that uh, authority so that they can claim it and they could not, I don't give it the, their authority. I remind them that they have this authority to, um, to be able to discern this, these patterns for themselves. And then, Oh, it clicks. Oh yes. The thing that I read over here on this side of the brain is clicking now with my experience and the emotional connections, what I have on this side of the brain, boom, I have a nice, um, holistic w way of thinking about it. I guess if we're thinking in our brains, I don't know if that's true, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's the idea is that, yes, it's not just about appealing to the authority of the people that came before us and said these things. It's about um, having that place where we can say, um, wow, I am also a, um, a part of this creation. And 
holy smokes, can I honor it by learning these things and, um, and really finding the, the glory of how beautiful and interconnected this world is through my own experience, you know? Yeah, man, I, there's a lot of stuff to go into here and we have plenty of time, but I'm um, now what feels most interesting to ask about is like, how has your relationship to life, you know, w what life is, <laughs> you know, how's your relationship to life changed by your getting in there and feeling and knowing all these different expressions of life? Like, what do you, you know, what is maybe some philosophy that you've picked up or de developed about what the realm is or <laughs> why we have these different expressions of like this being that is conscious of the experience of expressing what we call peppermint, <laughs> you know, but it's just the, I am in a consciousness of a certain feeling and uh, you know, quality, you know, what, what has that been like for you in terms of how has it changed your, your life and your experience or perception of life or meaning in life? That's a great question, man. Um, the the place that I that we have that we our shop that we work at is kind of like um, a lightning rod in the ground that attracts a lot of people that are like minded and come in and share their stories and the type of people that are really interested in um, helping themselves instead of like looking for me or the plant necessarily as like the savior and so it's constantly every day reinforcing in me this. Um, the elimination of the of the victim mindset, which is, you know, um, which is really, really important. I think um, I think probably the most crucial. I, I, I know that there's, you know, like um, there's Kelly Brogan was saying on on uh, Alpha Vedic that 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 victim mindset is the root of all disease and um, or at least spiritual disease, which in my view is the is all disease because it all starts there anyway. But um, so not only that, but it's like we have <laughs> some sort of magical place where we have there's so much synchro synchronicity that happens where i could think about somebody and they'll just pop in my head in like the old days when you used to be able to think about somebody and then they would call you on the call you on the landline telephone i don't know if that still works with cell phones but um oh yeah it does it used to happen to me all the time when i was a kid and that happens a lot there too and so i start to realize that um, and also because I, when I teach, um, one of the, the major projects that I give to the students is to find a plant ally. And I'm really interested in their um, presentation because it's a matter of them describing how that plant ally shifted their life. You know, I'm, I know a lot of the things about the plant, the, the reports that they give, but the thing that's really, whole, uh, you know, sticks out in my mind and my heart is the way that they talk about how these plants shift things in their life. And so, I'm around this all the time and I experience it all the time. So I, so I've just come with this, uh, deep, deep knowledge that everything is connected and that the plants that are around us are almost like, um, <laughs> transmitting these, these signals back and forth. Um, if we have the, the receptiveness to, to get to that, I see that also in the signatures as well of some of these plants. Um, and before I was into, you know, plant medicine, I was, I was playing music in a band and I, um, and I, I still enjoy playing music, but I, I was living the rock and roll lifestyle, you know, and I was, you know, you know out too late and drinking too much and smoking too much and all this stuff and really, uh, taking, uh, that, that burning pain and desire within me to have a, a more productive expression and just kind of dulling it because it was too painful. And, uh, it was, it, it's been healed on many, many ways, or at least the path to um, how it can be healed or is, is still a mystery, but it, it's, uh, it's there, it's unfolding uh, to me. So I have become in, philosophically and grounded and spiritually uh, much more, much more, I don't know, complete um, and happy. And uh, I feel like purposeful because uh, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual calling. Um, and, uh, it's just, a for me, it's also a great honor to just be in the role that I have as in our community and, um, as the teacher and the herbalist, I hope that answers your question, dude. Yeah, man. It's such, there's a big question in terms of how open-ended it is. And 
Honestly, I'm just here to get you to keep flowing because I could listen to you talk. You've got so much wisdom and yeah, that, that healing path. It's like at a certain point, you're like maybe not identifying with healing as much because you're more identifying with wholeness, but as vessels of the universal life force, we can always continue to do more wholeness <laughs> to find more like, because what we're doing is we're getting closer to the infinite kind of like nature expresses that Fibonacci sequence or phi where it's getting closer and closer to the golden mean proportion as nature continues its spiral, but it's like never actually touching it gets close, infinitely closer and closer to perfection as nature unfolds, but can never touch this transcendental that is the golden mean, as they call it. I love yep. that metaphor. And so like our path to our path through life and healing, even once we're like very <laughs> super whole and super powerful, but we can continue to do that, which purifies our body temple and our energy and finds better balance for us. Because like at a certain point, we're really doing it for the fractal. <laughs> we're healing the fractal, not even like our, our own self. I mean, not that it doesn't affect our self, but there's a, it's, it's awesome that it's designed in such a way that it's a infinite, infinite expansion, infinite continuum of further awesomeness. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, dude. I know. I call it the golden thread. I got that from, um, there's Steven Buner. He's been mentioned on your program. Uh, the, the guest that was talking about healing her Lyme was talking about Steven Buner. He's talked about, about this, um, uh, the, the poet William Bly and his poetry talks about this golden thread and following the golden thread. What is that golden thread? And, and um, I always try to visualize that in a meditation like this. There's this, imagine just being on a windy day and just seeing like a, a glimmer or a glint and just being like, what was that? And it's gone. It's like over there, it's in the wind and you just kind of like, and it's like, you know, it's blowing like the Fibonacci sequence too, right? And you're like, oh, I got to go find that golden thread. And you, you get really close to it and it just keeps, it keeps blowing away. But as you're following it, you see and you experience um, a path and a journey that brings you into um, your authentic authenticity and your health and your um, purpose and uh, in with relationships that you might not have experienced and into situations that you might not have thought about and unpeeling layers of uh, healing, like if, as if you're an onion and you're just getting closer and closer and closer to this golden thread, but it's always just a little bit. And then right when you grab it, you're like, oh, I, there it is. I got it. But then it's just like, it's so, it's so uh, wiggly and, and, uh, slippery that it just slips right away again. And you just keep following that golden thread. I kind of like that, um, about the fractal though. That's that, that also makes a lot of sense. I visualize that you just put my mind into a trippy place thinking about the fractal. <laughs> oh yeah. We're, we're really heating up here. <laughs> so another way of thinking about what you're describing, how, like, as soon as it feels like you grasp the thread, wait, wait, it's over there. You know, first of all, I love this metaphor because it describes how like our spiritual path as individuals in individuation is best walked by following, chasing, if you will, like what is most interesting and exciting. Oh, the shiny golden thread. That's the shiny thing. Go towards that. You know, <laughs> that's the way though. Like it's so obvious and apparent that excitement and fun are healthy and all like the definition of where we go for wholeness rather than what we've been taught by this Kronos culture, if you will, not to like rip on Kronos. I'm going to expand on what I mean by this, but you know, like that it's got to be a grind. It's got to be hard. It's got to be miserable. And there's, there's things that doing the suffering up front is healthy for you for enjoyment later. Like, but that type of suffering is not the same as soul crushing suffering you know it might be a form of suffering like you get sore from exercising but that's not the same as the suffering of you know job right running on the hamster wheel for somebody else's machine that you don't feel aligned with right there's different kinds of suffering unless you love running on wheels you're like this is this is so much fun like a hamster it, like hamsters love running on wheels. So it's like, okay. But then at that point you're following the fun. So you're doing it right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. 
<laughs> so, okay, I want to lay lay down a little bit more of an insight I had over the weekend and see how you maybe feel about this in the plant world. So I'm starting to get really suspicious that time doesn't actually work in perfect cycles. <laughs> like I'm starting to get suspicious that a year is not 365.25 days every time. And that a moon cycle is not 28, whatever decimal every time like that. There's wiggle there that maybe that's a good average. Maybe that's the best average you can come up with. And over a long period of time, because you have a solid average, you're not getting too off. But I don't think that I'm starting to think nature doesn't really work in this Kronos way that we have applied to it. Cause that's sort of like back to the idea of putting the language before the feeling that our relationship to time is the same way. And I found out that the Greeks have a word, two words for time. You know, they had two, four words for love and we just have love. For example, I found out they have two times and we just have time, but they have Kronos, which is the cycles of time that we measure. And the sky clock is an indicator of that. Uh, and then we have, in Greek, they have kurios, which is subjective time. And that's such an important concept because, like, first of all, we know that whenever we're in a grind or in a part of life we don't like or we're repetitive, doing the same thing every day, it feels like it flies by. <laughs> uh, or it feels like it drags on, I'm sorry. But then when we try to remember it, it feels like there's not much memory there. You know, took forever to get through. And then what we get to take back, take from it and keep is like almost nothing. <laughs> but when we're in the flow state, when there's novelty, when we're following our highest excitement and fun, you know, it feels like the days fly by sometimes. Sometimes they feel like they're stretching on to, but the memory that we keep is big. So this subjective time thing, right? Hmm. But how this applies to the plant world is why I wanted to see what you think about this is how... Yes, in roughly 365.25 days, we have a solar return. I'm, like I said, considering that maybe there's some wiggle there. But uh, that's Kronos time. But there's Curios time in the form of how, like, your plant might not bloom exactly the same day every year. Or the last frost of the season might be in April or it might be in May. You know what I mean? So yep. how... how <laughs> What is this making you think of? You know, uh, how can we expand on this idea? Uh, okay, I had a few a few thoughts. Um, first of all, I agree. Um, I think so. Like to me, I started thinking about this when um, a, a while back, before I had like a lot of knowledge with the plants, because I would my birthday would come. And I was like, it doesn't feel like my birthday. <laughs> like three days ago felt like my birthday. Like everything, like I was just like shining. Like I just felt like radiant and everything was really positive. Like, oh, that's just, that's just weird. Maybe, and then, you know, I just like chalked it up to, oh, it was just a good day and today is not such a good day or whatever. Um, but then I, I experienced that more and more with other dates. And then as I teach in, um, as I teach in the plants, and to people, I have been doing herb walks for 10 years now, at least. And so there's some, there's things that I do every year, annual, my annual solstice herb walk, my annual uh, Earth Day herb walk. I have, I have, there's like times of the year where I'm like every August, or I mean, every, you know, uh, um, June 21st and every April, whatever, 24th or whatever it is, things like that. And I started noticing a lot that I was like, this is weird. Maybe it's just the season. Um, but this, I had to cancel my Earth Day herb walk because there was a foot of snow still, like, <laughs> like one year. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. And there was things, there was patterns that just weren't there yet. And so I attributed it to being um, a slow season at the time or a fast season. But the more that I've been really relating to the season itself, like what is given as like the Gregorian calendar date versus what is like apparent in nature. I'm, I, I have, I'm coming uh, to the conclusion that I, I'm agreement. I'm in agreement with you that there are um, cycles that are just off a little bit or wobbly. And if we were to base the calendar on what is true and certain patterns of truth, then it wouldn't necessarily be like 
around circle it might maybe one year it's like like a an oval or something like we get a spring and then it's a summer a long summer and then a fall and then a long winter um and then the next year it's like the other way or something um and so i've I've definitely noticed that a lot with the plants and then as far as like um the 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 relationship between chronos and curios like so this is what i was thinking too i have this idea about like this uh the realm and um time and how things grow based on like the the um toroidal shape you know one moving one direction and the other moving the opposite direction internally and so i i don't know that's it just gave me a lot to think about what you just said about like um this chronos being like this outer movement you know of the sky clock and the sky patterns and then the inner inner movement on twisting in the opposite direction and at its like furthest out point which is in in the inner direction which is closest to the uh, the the energetic exchange in the toroidal field to the chronos that's where nature would lie so it's it's still slightly reflective there but there's still some some uh, discrepancies whereas we uh, at least in our uh, controllered uh, state is like really really close to um that that it, i don't know man it's, it's, it's kind of getting away from me but um I'm, i started to think about it that way but i also think that um when i'm the the best days that i could think of are days that i'm uh doing something natural to me you know natural to me so for me in my my life like that means like going out and foraging or doing an herb walk or like being out in nature and i and i know that doesn't mean that for everyone but it could also be like doing my qigong um in the in the day it's just being in nature and then and then here i am in a room and there's like artificial lights and there's sunlight too but um when i come when i come into these more um these types of environments i think that that's probably more of the uh the play of that um enslavement of the chronos if you will and and being in the the natural expression form is is probably more of that curious is that how you pronounce it yeah dude it's exactly like what we were saying with language that chronos is the language and curious is the feeling so yeah. you know we don't even have to call Kronos always enslavement. It's only enslavement if Kronos gets it before Curios. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because even our talk today, we had a Kronos time, but then Curios determined that like actually a little later is when it feels good. <laughs> and yeah. so we put Curios before Kronos. So we weren't enslaved by it. You know, it wasn't like we didn't have right. to put the round peg in a square hole. Right. So I think it's again, it's just about the order. And that even the astro logos of the sky clock, if you put that first, like you get philosophies like the, the planets are controlling me, <laughs> you know, rather than that they're describing what's going on in consciousness and curios and feeling. So I just wanted, to, that's something I've really been noodling lately and that's how this insight. map and terrain thing and feeling and language thing. And it applies to what you do with herbs completely because your doctrine of signatures, which Okay, so there's a lot of directions to go from here. I want to talk about these tinctures that you gave me because I would love for people to have, especially in the free hour, some idea of the type of medicines that you offer, of which there are many. So I ordered from you this young lung tincture right here, which has got many different ingredients. And maybe you could go through that with us and talk about some of the qualities of these medicinal herbs that went in this tincture, but then you went ahead and added in so many different gifts, which I'll describe afterwards. But this young lung tincture has been great for me. I'm somebody that has a human design, for lack of a better word, of holding my tension in constriction of the lungs. That's just like my first go-to place to hold some tension. Mm -hmm. And it's not that that's, that's not even bad. You know, symptoms aren't even bad. <laughs> It's just like, oh, I see that. I need to go through that. I need to express that dissonance so that it can get back into harmony. But this young lung tincture has been very helpful for the construct constriction here. And, uh, you know, let's talk about your tinctures. And this one is a great example of 
something highly effective and medicinal that you're making and maybe describe some of the ingredients and, sure. and their qualities. I call that what you were just describing there, the gate. Um, Cause I think about our immune system in a, in a, in a way that it could be like a fortress, you know? And so you have your, you have your walls all around. And if there was, I don't know, an energetic pattern, let's say that wanted to invade or um, an energetic pattern that wanted to uh, um, be seen, it would be, it would go to the gate, you know, bring its battering rams and stuff. It's way easier than bringing a bunch of ladders and grappling hooks. So it comes to the gate. For me, my gate is my lymphatic glands under here. So these are the things that are always kind of speaking to me, you know? Um, And, and I, and I recognize that as like, oh, this is the communication. Like, oh, the, like the word from the gate is, um, Interesting uh, because gate has a phonetic connections in many languages to wisdom, wisdom and gate. Oh, cool. And also like the head or the first or the crown in terms of like what's in charge. So yep. anyway, that gate is also where you've, your wisdom is at in a way. Cool. And, um, and so that's also interesting because, you know, it, to me, those centers are something that we could recognize in ourselves as like shadow centers as well, or things that need more attention to be expressed. Um, if I were to bend a straw in half, then like it bends and it gets a little kink in its spot. And then every time I bend it after that, it's going to bend in that spot. And so it's that to me, that has a, something to, something to say about, you know, you, you're, you you got a lot of uh, wisdom. You got a lot of something in here. That's, that's, that's held. And it's uh, you're, you're doing a really good job of, uh, working through that through all of the types of work that you do and for me it's the same it's uh it's i have a lot to say but i don't always say everything that i need to say so it's kind of uh gets congested down in there so they could be they could be something um i, I could think of them in just ways of uh, being you know physical right and this is what a lot of people will come when they're looking for something they just want they have expressions of physical um uh health that they're looking for but then we can also apply energetic and you know spiritual emotional patterns as well and often in the tor- in the form of like re- rhetoric or rhetorical questions for what it's worth you know uh this this area also represents like um grief and things that we hold on to or want to just like uh, hold first or things like that anyway so um in the young lung I like to, I'm a real sucker for alliteration and puns and rhyming and stuff. So I try to make, I try to make my products fun. And also because I can't make claims, which is also a way of kind of keeping in honor. So it's not, uh, you know, um, bronchial, uh, bronchitis, uh, tincture or whatever it's young lung. And it's got, um, plants called, let's see, elecampane. I harvest that from my garden. Um, elecampane is Helen of the campagna um and she was holding uh, a, a bunch of this plant when she was abducted by paris and when she was crying and uh, leaving um in her in in, the, in that story um where she went across the campagna or the field this this plant grew and so maybe that's how they they were able to track her down um and that plant also in addition to it having a specific uh quality of uh dispelling mucus in particular um green and yellow mucus it's also helps uh for those who feel like they um they have been they're a foreigner or they've been abandoned they're they're no longer in their homeland they have something to say but they can't really express it because they don't have the language to do so and of course here we are again back to manifestation of energetic patterns into physical form and so Ella Campaign, Helen of the Campania, um, is really helpful for, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's aromatic. And by aromatic plants, by the smell of an aromatic plant, we can tell that it's going to move congestion. doesn't matter what, it's going to move congestion. If you could smell it, like if you could crush it up and it has that aromatic smell, it's going to do something. And all of the aromatic plants, I always think of them as like, they go to the college of, conge- of decongestant. But then they have their majors. And so Ella Campaign's like, my major is the lungs. And um, Rosemary is also in this plant. It's like, my major is also the lungs. But I, I also majored in decongesting the um, capillaries to the, go to the brain. Um, and Osha is like, my, my major, o- Osha's in this blend as well. It's also known as bare root. Um, is like, my, my major is also in decongesting the lungs. But I also decongest the, um, the stomach. 
And so there's, there's a lot of connection. And then there's a plant in there that's really special to me called New England Aster. And New England Aster is a plant I love and I heart. It's like the last flower of the year, the last wildflower. And that's a plant that has this beautiful signature. It's yellow with a bunch of purple um, fans coming off. And sometimes they're really open on a, on a plant and sometimes they're closed simultaneously. And so this yellow solar plexus fanning out um, uh, the, the um, uh, Udana Vayu, the movement of the outward breath, and also opening and closing, opening and closing on the same plant. So it looks like, you know, a, it's breathing. So New England Aster is a plant that is wonderful for relaxing tension in the diaphragm. So sometimes the patterns can hold other patterns. They, our body finds that stressful pattern and it just tries to hold it back. And that stress from holding it back starts to create more internal stress and in all these other ways that it's holding pat patterns back. And so sometimes that can just be like relaxing into a deep, deep breath. And that's what New England Aster really helps with is, uh, and we could also tell that in addition from its physical signatures to its flavor, it's also aromatic and it has like an acridity to it. Plants that have like an acridity um, or a skunkiness have a relaxant action. So it's mildly relaxing, but specifically to the to the diaphragm. And um, I, I don't remember what else is in there. Maybe elderberries, which also have many, many signatures of the of the breath, the breath, uh, Gemini ruler, rulership, uh, mutable signatures that we find in a lot of these plants as well. Yeah, it's got that and plantain and Solomon's seal. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Plantain. I love plantain for just about anything. It's a it's a garden weed and it grows, you know, abundantly and around me. And it's just basically saying, like, use me. And it's a great one for just healing up um, mucosal tissues. And um, a lot of people know this plant as like a mosquito bite plant. You can take plantain and chew it up and put it on your mosquito bite and it heals it up. But it does the same thing with the mucosal tissues in our body. And I got some Solomon seal right here, actually. This is a, I picked this from the garden this morning. And I'll give a little commentary for those listening too. But um, Solomon seal is a very magical plant. It's um it's a plant that is um um used a lot in voodoo and hoodoo for quote unquote conjuring uh and sorry conquering. So it's a plant that has like this uh, ability to help with conquering whatever uh whatever that means. <laughs> I think it means like subjecting your will over the over the other person. Um maybe not necessarily in a in a malevolent way. Um, this is what um, plants do as well, you know, and I like to have when I um, formulate plant uh, formulas, I like to use a, an activator in Ayurveda. The term is dipana, which means it like it, it, it tells the other things what to do. So this is the activator, but it's not a harsh activator. Like sometimes I use ginger and sometimes I use a little bit of something that's got like some fire to it. And in this case, because it's the lungs, I want it to be soft. And so Solomon seal helps a lot with the softness. Um, I could go on about this plant too. Um, and, but yeah, Solomon seal, one, one, one amazing magical plant. Yeah. And that makes perfect sense. Part of that softness is important for relaxing <laughs> the constriction in that area. And there's, so maybe this would be a good time to talk about Doctrine of Signatures and use some of these plants more as an example for, because we've talked to, you know, we're, we're dancing around it, but maybe define what that is for those who haven't heard what we're talking about with Doctrine of Signatures and maybe help people realize that if they've got some knowledge of the occult, if you will, or something in the realm of correspondences and colors and, you know, different vibratory patterns that you may attribute one to another. For example, the chakra system, like this first one that we talked about in the young lung, the Ella campaign or Hella Campania, Helen Campania, however you want to, you know, syncretize that. I love that, that there's a story to it. You know, it has this sunflower look to it. It, the flower of this plant looks like the sun and we're dealing with something in the solar plexus region, the way it's named is, you know, telling you about solar plexus and will because she's being taken against her will. Right. So yep. as a medicine, it's telling you a lot about what it does in the name, the mythology of that name, if you're able to syncretize that or know what 
it's implying, Ella Campania, and uh, the color, the solar plexus color, or the another example would be the New England Aster, being that it's got the yellow in the middle and the purple, you know, radiating out from it in the flower, telling you about this connection between your crown chakra and your solar plexus chakra. Yep. That like your spiritual authority, if you will, crown chakra is an as above, so below to your physical will to act. Yep. You know? Yep. So yeah, doctrine of signatures. Um, that's a, I guess that's a term that was coined by Paracelsus back in whenever 15, 11, 15, 12, something like that. Um, and basically what he, what this very interesting fella was uh, getting at is that there are, these um that nature speaks in poetic ways it doesn't have um it's not necessarily logical and when it comes through in these patterns these poetic ways it can bypass these stop gaps and filters of our logical mind and get into the part of our of our where we see things and learn things that is associated with the symbolic nature. Yeah, it's basically green language you're describing. Being able to read between the lines, the puns and the wordplay that comes through maybe even beyond the intention of the speaker or the writer. And in that is actually carrying more information from spirit or source or creator or logos. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's why I think that like scriptures and stuff are in verses because they can ha- p- convey that poetic meaning. And then um, and then we see these things in nature through the doctrine of signatures. But I, but it, the signatures are, you know, nature isn't it's very, very economical. It doesn't want it doesn't make things willy nilly. It's using patterns that it's going to uh, use in other in in for other instances and it's doing so through um through energetic expression so if so in other words let's say uh like apples don't just like one day are like i'm gonna be indigo because if if apples were indigo one day then we would be able to see them and be like oh that's really good for you know this area right here um but we don't we see apples as red and we know that they they are good for our material body um and maybe even our heart um, so, yeah, so in other words, nature takes these uh, s- patterns that it that it uses and it puts them into the plants It uses them. It, put, it, it works with uh, spirit and creates these, um, as Rupert Sheldrake, Sheldrake would call them, like morphic fields. Right. They're generated into morphic fields. And that same pattern, it's like, oh, cool. I made uh, I made a liver with that pattern once. So I'm just going to make this plant into that shape because they they share the same kind of uh, morphic resonance in a way that that this plant that can be really helpful for my liver will look like a liver or this plant that looks like a lung. Um, And so we we also have to use our imagination sometimes because not everybody back in time or even now knows what a liver looks like or what a lung looks like because we're we're working through uh symbolism and we're working through um the imaginal realm so it's not just about the um the shape of the organ but there's many many things like for example the um the colors the way that it looks on the ground is it is its flower like right on the ground is it is it beautiful high is it bowing in in reverence or is it showing the depressed look of somebody like um is it showing the upright stature of somebody of of somebody that can help generate that so it's working within all different forms of energetic patterns not just the the organ state itself but mental spiritual patterns and then also in the sky clock too we see the same we see similar um uh, mix match between the the um the astrological sign if you will whether it's tropical or sidereal or maybe we can even just say the season um, because of course we're naming we're naming those things those patterns but those patterns also exist right they're they're fundamentally there um and that's the reason why 
um, things like Lumashi uh, will continue, like the, the naming of the, of the constellations will always have to have truth in it because otherwise the stories won't be able to last. They have to have, they have to be able to have, to express something that's true. And so a lot of times people will take a, take an idea like that and just be like, oh, that's just like nonsense because it's just a, it's a mnemonic device. It's, cre- it's intended to help you remember but not if you don't know anything. If you can learn, if you have a whoop blank slate and you say, oh, okay, I'm going, I'm going in as a total newbie. And I, and, and our human beings are hardwired for this kind of communication. The plants, the, the nature things are signaling to us for our attention. And they're saying, look at me, look at me. I'm, I'm in this pattern. I'm in this pattern. Um, I'm abundant or I'm, or I'm rare. You have to go out into the woods to find me because you have to, because I'm for those rare cases or things like that. So there's all this signaling going on back and forth between, um, between us. And uh, we don't, yeah, we don't need to use them as, uh, mnemonic devices. It's like, oh, an antiquated cultural, you know, like uh, those, those, um, those farmers, they didn't know anything. And so that was the, that was the thing with Paracelsus too. That's why, that's why they ran him out of town because he was introducing these ideas and they're like, no, that's not the priest class. That's not the academics. Those are, those are coming from the sorcerers and the, and the soldiers and the midwives and all these things. And he's saying, it's true though. It's true. Yeah, calling the doctrine of signatures a mnemonic device for remembering is exactly what we've been talking about, putting language or memorization in front of feeling and experience. Oh, wow. (laughs) I'm sure we, I would love you to get more into this topic and I have a ton of questions and now we're getting towards the end of the first hour. So we want to make sure and give you plenty of space to talk about how people can learn more from you, how people can support your shop and benefit in return and like anything that you're excited about announcing or ways that people can get in touch, you know, please do your plugs and uh, don't feel like you have to rush either. Thanks. Thanks chance. Um, yeah. Tippy canoe herbs is com is my website. If you're in Milwaukee or in Wisconsin, stop in our shop. It's a unique place and uh, we'll take good care of you too. We've had a couple of your listeners come in actually. So I had a really very, I have, I have very cool conversations with these people. So as you can imagine, <laughs> and our um, audience here is unbelievable. Yeah. So, so intelligent. Totally. Yeah. And so my, um, my wife and I, we, we started this, this stuff and, uh, she's a mom. So we're step, she's kind of stepping into that role. Um, or uh, not kind of, she's fully embodied in that role <laughs> and moving away from the, um, presence at our shop, but not in, um, not just, uh, just in physical form. She's definitely there in spirit. She's created all of our aesthetics, all of our logos. I always say that I'm just like the, the hippie that puts the potions in the bottle and she does everything else. She makes everything look nice and makes all the labels and has made our store in the beautiful way it is. But my, uh, my calling that I'm, uh, have been working on for many years now is in teaching. I do a lot of uh, programs, but updating that calling into a online sphere so I could reach more people. So I've been doing um, uh, astro aromatics classes, which will be fun to talk about maybe an hour or two. And we're talking, we do this, it's incense making based on the the sky clock and the, uh, the nature of some of these plants and their relationship to the sky clock. And um, learning how to, you know, make incense. How, how can I deliver that in an online way? I feel like Sagittarius will teach me. So hopefully in Sagittarius, I'll get, I'll get, I'll get it out to the masses. Um, but I have been doing, um, on, an online course right now. That's been excellent. And it's a foundations of, of herbalism. I do an online or a in-person course as well. And I do all kinds of stuff, classes. And the, in the wintertime, I really just kind of focus on the, the being there for people. Cause that's when that's tea time. That's when people really need the herbalist. And then once spring comes back I get, get my foragers hat back on and I go out in the field and I do my teaching. So if you're interested in learning with me, look for, um, our classes, they'll start in the springtime again, and I'll put up a few classes throughout the winter as well. And 
Yeah. And if and you're people interested, can find that at tippecanoeherbs.com, which is a beautiful website. It is extremely aesthetically pleasing, easy to navigate. The classes will be right up there at a top tab. Thanks. Yeah. And I also do, I also do clinical work too. I, I do consulting with people with, with the background that I have. So if you're interested in every day, I'm making custom formulas for multiple people. So if you have something going on, it's best to just uh, write or call my shop and we can spend as much time as you need and talk about it. I don't ever charge for consultations. And, um, and then I guess one last thing, I just wanted to say um, how awesome and it is to be chit chatting with you today, Chance. It's an honor to be here. I love your program. I love all the guests that you have. I wanted to, I wanted to give lots of shout outs as well, but I'll, I'll wait till hour two for that. So, Oh no, shout out away. Let's was, do that. You know, I was thinking about, we we're talking about the Bertaria event and I was just, when, when we were there, we were right next to family fun guy, the family that you've had on, you had Elise on recently, the previous episode from, from here, I believe. And, um, James of course is, um, and I just, when I was, um, so when we were hanging out with them, I was thinking about how grateful I am to God that, um, you know, sometimes you, a door closes and you have to kind of grieve that door closing. And for me, it's been like, you know, friendships and, and things like that, that this uh, lifting of the veil has revealed for what it is and not being able to see it before or not wanting to see it before. We're going to see it now and then grieving that and opening up new doors and, uh, um, cultivating new relationships. And I was really happy to be um, stationed in happenstance and blessed in that way to be next to them and get to know their family. And of course you were hanging out with us all weekend too. And um, we're, we're like in love with Missouri and we're on our way there. We're going to get there someday. I even put an offer on some land. It didn't work out timing wise, but it wasn't the right one. But um, one of these so, sooner or later chance we're going to be neighbors and um, it's going to be really cool to uh, work on the community <laughs> in that in the Ozarks. So I'm really excited. So I wanted to give a big shout out, much love to James, at least their beautiful family and tell them. Uh, and then all the other people that are in this community that um, who I really adore. I really enjoy Michelle's work. Um, I, I, I appreciate her friendship. She was the one that actually introduced me to your show, um, and through Mario. And so, yeah, it's really cool how, you know, um, your, your show also kind of reminds me of my shop in the way that it's just, it's just a hub of all of this really interesting synchronicity. Take what you need, take what you will, um, take what you want. It's all good. It's all it's there for everyone. There's plenty to go around and then come back for more later. And, um, and then while you're at it, develop some friendships and, um, and see how true and good the people are in your community. And I really, really appreciate what you're doing, man. So great job. <laughs> Dude, the kind words, it's, it's a really strong hit me in the feels there, buddy. It, uh, it, it continually just blows me away the quality of people that are listening to this show, you being one of them, that somebody as knowledgeable, wise, developed as yourself, that like you like what we're doing here, that just gives me all the more, <laughs> all the more excitement to keep going. Not that I needed it, but it's just like, wow, I'm in a huge overabundance of uh, excitement and motivation about doing what it is that I'm doing here. And I'm like, I have the easy part. You guys are all out there making stuff happen, building things from the ground up. And I just sort of like let you talk about your great work. And uh, apparently I'm fortunate enough and blessed enough too that people like yourself are congregating and moving towards where I live. So even without having to go anywhere, it's like, okay, I'm at the center of a vortex here. I'll, I'll take it. This is great. <laughs> Yeah, you deserve yeah, man. it. man, everybody check out tippecanoeherbs.com and that'll be linked in the show notes and really just give Kyle's website a perusal. It is really awesome. Like extremely good website, great products. We're going to talk more about, you know, the custom blends that he might, yeah, we'll talk about mine as an example because he made me a custom tincture and uh, the Astro Aromatics sounds great. And I have other questions to dive into as well. So we have a lot on the table. 
thank you so much for being here. Can't wait to jump into hour two. And please, everybody, go check out Tip Canoe Herbs. You will find something there that suits you just fine. So thanks, Kyle. Thank you for tuning in. I'm so excited about this one, but I always say that, (laughs) but for real, yeah, Kyle was the man. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while, I guess. Time is weird. As we got into this conversation and you heard, there is a big difference between measured time and subjective time. And although I first met Kyle in person, hung out with him at the Bertaria National Festival, in september it feels like months not weeks in terms of how long ago that was a lot of subjective time has been occurring for me since then really excited about all the personal life changes and developments but all that aside i highly highly encourage you to go get on typica new herbs website and just peruse the options there i love that kyle is teaching now and even though we're just focusing on him It's really a family jam, like his wife, Serena, who is quite an awesome person who I had just as much fun being around as I did Kyle at the Bertaria Fest. Uh, As Kyle gave her some praise, like she's doing so much of that aesthetic, (laughs) bringing the beauty to it. He says, I'm just the hippie mixing potions. I love that. The potions are potent. Okay. Give it a shot. It's worth it. If there's a particular issue or as Kyle was talking about, I love the concept, a gate that's a personal gate for you and your body as like a language crux point on how you can interflow more easily. Uh, Like I was saying, mine tends to be more in the lungs and solar plexus constriction-y type thing. I guess more kind of like the bridge between heart and solar plexus. But yeah, uh, we each have our spot. Kyle was saying his is more of a thyroid. And if there is a medicine that he's creating, that might be good for one of your personal gates. I think you should give it a go. I particularly enjoy and appreciate the inner herbs blend (laughs) that he created, uh, the garden variety just for me. I think he should put it up on the shop as a a regular item. It's really powerful, uh, enhancing synchronicity, awareness and communication is the goal. And it's one of those like, just a drop type jams and it works quite effectively. I really love it. Uh, The whole conversation of herbalism and the magic of the doctrine of signatures and how nature is communicating with us all the time through these shapes and patterns and vibrations and all that. Like, this is so cool. This is the syncretism of the the natural world. This is where the value in synchromysticism really comes to play. It's not about, Knowing the most facts about mythology or the most stories, it's about how does this teach us about nature? Like that uh, Elena Campania herb that he talked about, how we know the story of Helen of Troy. And so the mythology that fits in to the naming convention of that, which helps us know the qualities and the virtues of that herb, that's the real good stuff. That's the real juice. Like, how can we apply? the mythology and the language that we're interested in to knowing something that's true about nature. That is where the good is. 
I mean, that's where the value is. I mean, philosophy, metaphysics, that's all cool too. But <laughs> what about the place we live? Can we learn something about the place we live? Okay. So I should tell you about the extension. You guys probably know how it works. If you're not on Rockfin or Patreon though, if you're new to the show or just need a reminder, there's a second hour of this conversation and every other main episode of Interverse for the low, low price of $5 a month on Patreon or $10 a month through Rockfin. Worth it to go the Rockfin route though, because you get unlimited Gnosis updates from the many channels there that put out premium content, like the one-on-one -on -one podcast, like Lindsay Sharman of Rogue Ways, like Odin's Alchemy, Benjamin Balderson, probably a lot of the stuff those guys are putting on that Rockfin is not even premium and you can watch for free, which is cool too. If you want to watch the video episodes of Interverse, Rockfin's a good way to do it. I do make sure and put the free version of the show up there too if you're still not ready to pull the trigger. However, like yeah, $10 a month, $5 a month, whatever the case may be, it's not that big of a commitment. And you guys all chipping in really helps fill the bucket for me to cover my expenses and you know eat healthy food and live uh, my best life. <laughs> Appreciate it. The reciprocity of you and me sharing energy towards this goal of our expanding imagination, higher level of consciousness, getting closer to the I am. It's really good. I definitely couldn't do this without you. You know, if I was just talking in, to the microphone alone, that would be one thing. And I'd get a lot out of these conversations with our friends like Kyle, but to be able to know that on the other side of the earbuds are people like Mr. Typica New Herbs, Kyle Denton, or the family fungi family, Elise and James, who we talked to both recently and we all hung out together with Kyle and Serena and many others. George Mesa, recent guest, also a listener. That is beautiful to me <laughs> to know who I'm talking to and everyone in the Telegram chat that chips in and makes that community feel so great. If you're not a part of that community, I hope you consider getting the app especially if you're already using some other crappy kind of social media like Instagram, why not shift your in emphasis to a more proper syllable like the Telegram group chat that we have. Beautiful, beautiful tribe there. So much to learn from each other. So much awesome stuff shared every day. Links to that and everything else that I might mention in this outro will be in the show notes of this episode and every other. So without further ado, if you want to get on the Rockfin or Patreon extended episode, you will hear about the philosophy, Kyle's philosophy, that is, of blending herbs for tinctures and the philosophy of dosages when you, might, when you might need a lot versus when you might need a little. The why, who, what, why, how, where of all that. The role, Kyle talks about, you know, the role of the healer as a, whether it's a medicine maker or a vibrational tuner, <laughs> the role of that person as the facilitator to anchor the unconditioned I am essence of source or God and just hold that down and witness that for the other being so that they can get to that unconditioned state where they can change into what is most harmonious for them to go through the distance and find harmony. Once again, we discussed astro aromatics, which is something Kyle teaches. I think that is so cool. The astrology of aromas and that particular part of the talk, we focused in on Aries as an example, but he, Kyle is teaching that on his website and in person at his shop, Astro Aromatics for all 12 signs of the sky clock. I think that's really cool. And that led us into discussing the frequency of scent and reclaiming our sense of smell, smell and its relation to the emotional body. We talked about connecting to plant medicines that you have a relationship with via imagination once you've already opened the door instead of having the physical substance. So that's some real magic alchemy, great work. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> you know, I know what peppermint smells like and I know what peppermint feels like. Can I, can I become peppermint without needing to actually have the peppermint? Turns out, yes. And I love that. So he, he's giving away some really deep secrets here. <laughs> uh, we talk about the idea of the plant, how the idea of the plant itself and the name carrying the signature and the idea, the ideal, the concept that it is itself medicine that people can work with the plant without even having the physical plant or a tincture, writing its name down, carrying it around. Also how these plants, you know, to finish up and round off that conversation, it kind of led us to realizations about how, the external use of the plant medicine does help us learn how to do the great work 
internally. It's beautiful. Um, discussed the philosophers like Paracelsus. We talked about symptoms and dissonance, you know, why those aren't bad and why we need to express and go through those and why they make us stronger and not, you know, to be feared and shied away from. And then we, we finished up with uh, talking about the truth of the black walnut tree. <laughs> How, so, as an example of uh, this doctrine of signatures and knowing a plant's virtues, you know, uh, by by what it does and by the patterns and the cymatics of it, the geometries of it. So we use the black walnut tree as an example. And he talks about how black walnut trees vibrationally pattern their environment. It is really cool. I'd love to talk to Kyle again. I'm curious more about his wild harvesting, wild food for foraging and herb foraging. Maybe get some tips about how he's doing that. Curious about the uh, learning curve of going from, you know, a newbie novice to great teacher like he is, that's probably, there's probably a lot more that we can juice out of that particular life story of his. And again, I just love Kyle. I love that he calls himself a vitalist. I totally feel that vital. And you know what? Okay. So I should probably talk a little bit about music and sky because I'm fresh back from that. Go get that Rockfin extension or Patreon extension, guys. That was all uh, my summary of it, but go get it. It's worth it. Music and Sky, though, that Alpha Vedic threw, if you've been listening for any length of time, you know about this because I'm reminding you over and over again. And now it has happened, and I'm back from that great journey, and it was awesome. Met so many people that I love, uh, on that I've loved and had friendship with online in the real and there's too many to name. Met some great listeners of Interverse, some friends that I've done tunings for remotely that now we got to meet in person. I tuned dozens and dozens of people with my big giant tuning fork and got even better at the at facilitating a quick opening of the gate. <laughs> I was, it's great that Kyle uses that phrase because that's what I was calling it all weekend. Like you know, instead of an hour session, let me just tune you up in about three to five minutes and I can find the gate, the precise gate that your energy is bottlenecking at. Open that gate, you're in flow. And sometimes it would even cause like tears to flow. You know, sound is powerful whenever within two minutes of hitting the fork, the person that you just met is now crying tears <laughs> of release, which happened a bunch of times. It's amazing. I mean, it helps to have very open and, and ready, prepared participants in the tuning process. If that's something you want to do with me, hit me up, chance at interversepodcast.com. Get on my schedule. We'll do a big one hour tuning session, get to the roots of whatever things may be uh, ready to transform from dissonant to harmonious. We will find it. We will shift it. We will return your life force, vital energy back to circulation in your core. It is good stuff. Very good process. You'll love it. It's super fun. We get to hang out for an hour plus. What's not to love? Hit me up. Let's do a tuning. <laughs> uh, I met Eileen Day McCusick on the tuning subject, the tuning guru who I learned it all from by reading her books. And we had a lot of fun getting to know each other better. And we're basically best buds now, I'm pretty sure. You'll see her back on the show soon. And I felt like I passed uh, my final exam <laughs> because she needed or she requested an assist with uh, some discomfort she was having. And I tuned it up and bing, bang, boom. It was all right as rain after the big fork did its thing. And to me, that's like, as somebody that never got the, the certificate, never went through the official training and just sort of puzzled out the process on my own and learned from her books about it. You know, it was like tuning the teacher. That's my final exam. And I feel like I passed. And so I'm at a whole new level of confidence about what I do. I already knew that it was working and it was powerful. But it is nice to have that fun experience of confirmation with the universe and Eileen, universe in the form of Eileen. She's a beautiful, beautiful human being, super fun to hang around with. So is Mike Winter. I would have loved to spend more time hanging with him, but he was just like scooting around the festival on his one wheel, taking care of business left and right. He was an amazing leader and conductor of the whole show. I think there were probably 300, 350 people there. Hard to guess. A lot of kids, a lot of full families. It was awesome in Southern California, in the Cuyama Valley. I could tell stories about it forever. And probably the best thing will be, maybe I'll be able to get on like a, a decompression live stream soon with some other people who are there. But 
If not, you'll just probably hear me drop things that I had incited from the experience here and there, as I did in this conversation. A lot of the insights I had during Music and Sky do align with Kyle's perspectives, and it was cool that they kind of came through naturally. Uh, there was a live interverse at the festival, which, as far as I know, was successfully recorded audio and video. And at some point, ideally, we'll get that out on my channel. Hope I didn't spoil it <laughs> by announcing it. But I mean, the, the work's done. I'm pretty sure it was recorded. They did a great job with all their tech there. So I'm excited to put that out. It was like a panel between myself, Eileen, and Alec Zek. And Dr. Kelly Brogan talked about the magical land that we live in, the magical world, the magical reality, the magical life. And that's kind of a broad topic, but we got into all kinds of good stuff. Now, I'm already 15 minutes deep, and I wanted to talk about in the outro how this doctrine of signatures and this language of herbs and the things that Kyle was teaching us in this conversation, how that pertains to actual written language. But I'll just mention it in passing, and I won't go deep on it. I have a lot more research to do on the subject anyway, but from reading Anacalypsis by Godfrey Higgins, uh, the amazing 1823 gigantic Bible of Bibles, like it's the Bible of all the Bibles and scriptures is <laughs> the syncretizing Bible of everything. It's amazing. And in it, he puts forward a theory very convincingly that the first letters were derived from leaves. And it makes a lot of sense because leaves, uh, letters, I mean, of the uh, original alphabets also corresponded to trees and that maybe the letters were named after those trees. Maybe those were the names of different trees. And because each letter of each different or each leaf of each different tree species has a different shape, you could go and collect leaves and arrange them kind of like alphabet soup and create a, a language out of that. And I think maybe that was the first secret written language, possibly, possibly, um, which is cool because it sort of ties everything up in a nice bow of this herbal language that nature is speaking to us and our actual human languages and uh, language, language, language. This talk was a lot about that. Anyway, I'm probably going on pretty long here. I'll wrap it up, but I would love to get in touch with anybody out there through Telegram or, you know, hit us up in the community, get in there and get active. It's worthwhile. And a tuning would be awesome. Looking forward to the next thing, the next episode, always something good coming. I have a good surprise for you all. I should announce it now. The next interverse is going to be with Mario Garza. And we're going to also hopefully be doing a giveaway. So probably the best way to find out about the giveaway prize that Mario wants to offer to the audience as a, a you know, fun extra thing for the next interverse episode, the best way to get in touch or like to find out how that's going down would be to be on our telegram. So watch out there for the announcement. Thank you for listening to my announcement about an announcement, announcing an announcement before it has been announced. <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and stop now. I'll play us out with Volo. That's the music I'm going to play us out with. Volo. Awesome. Check it out. V-O-L-O -O on Spotify or SoundCloud. This is a song called Force of Nature from the EP of the same name. And I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kyle and Serena and your little baby Davide. Beautiful family, beautiful medicine, beautiful wisdom. Life is good. I hope you know it because <laughs> I know it. It's really good. And I'll talk to you guys all soon. Love ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.